Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. The government talks of a new golden era in shipbuilding for the Royal Navy, but how many ships and by when? We'll be looking at the future shape of the Navy and assessing what it can learn from current conflicts. We must learn the lessons from Ukraine, quite rightly, but we must make sure we learn the right lessons and not false lessons. Simon Newton reports from Poland on the exercise designed to reinforce the alliance's eastern flank and deter Russia. 2,500 British troops are taking part. The, the conflict that we've seen in the moment is showing the absolute importance of overhead protection, not least just from artillery and mortar rounds coming in, but also cover from view from air. And we'll be discussing how soldiers should balance taking ground in conflict with the duty to protect historic sites and artefacts. Sitrep with Kate Chabot. So, with Mike away this week, Professor Peter Roberts has kindly agreed to step up and join us for this episode. Peter, welcome to SITREP. Thanks very much. Delighted to be here. Big shoes to fill. <laughs> so, you are a former warfare officer in the Royal Navy and a senior fellow at the defence think tank RUSI. And, and your timing, Peter, it's immaculate. Two big events this week, looking at the future for maritime power. And you were chairing one session at the think tank RUSI. Is this a key time, do you think, for naval strategy? Well, it's certainly important, but the plans are late. They're really late. And navies always have plans and ambitions. They're usually unaffordable. They lack the political will to make them happen. So in the UK, the last time there was a coherent naval plan was in 1998, after the Strategic Defence Review. That enabled or imagined a balanced fleet. We certainly don't have that today. But that plan, even back in 1998, didn't survive contact with budgets or politics. Peter, plenty to talk about today. Looking forward to your thoughts in the programme. Well, a golden age of shipbuilding, the Defence Secretary's words this week at a Sea Power conference. Grant Shapps said up to six amphibious warships will be built to help fight the conflicts of the future. Plans for these multi-role support ships were introduced in the 2022 National Shipbuilding Strategy. Overall, Mr Shapps said 28 Royal Navy vessels were in design, on order or under construction. Construction. Commodore Steve Prest is an independent consultant who just left the Navy last month after almost 25 years of service, including time as Director of Navy Acquisition. He told me planning for the multi-role support ships has been going on for some time. Really, this is the, the accumulation of uh, a lot of work that's gone into the concept phase, and that's been going on inside the Navy. What Secretary of State really confirmed this week was that these, uh, what would have previously been, in his words, desirable, uh, despite being in their the policy command papers and the strategies, uh, are now funded. Uh, at least, as he said, for the first three, uh, and then and then possibly up to six in due course. So, what is special about the capabilities of these ships to be used by the Royal Marines? Well, the commando force is uh, going through. Uh, a, quite a profound transformation at the moment and really returning to its commando roots. So if you think that um, perhaps large formations of brigade landing across a beach in a sort of saving private Ryan style is, is, is perhaps what we were geared up for previously, the sort of weaponry that our adversaries have now make that really rather improbable uh, a course of action. So what the commandos need is the ability to operate in smaller, more dispersed, yet better connected teams um, with weaponry that can reach further and deliver greater strike capability as part of that commando force. So they need to be able to operate from the sea and they need ships, therefore, which can allow them to insert into uh, their areas of operation and provide them with the aviation uh, support, the um, the landing craft uh, insertion, and there's, there's another project um, which is spinning up to, to provide the new insertion craft for the Royal Marines, and then to be supported with all of the, the logistics and the fires and um, the medical facilities. And that's what these ships will provide into the uh, 2030s and beyond. 
And the phrasing is up to six, but uh, they're replacing a definitive number of six other ships, including the two landing platform docks, three landing ship docks and support ship RFA Argus. Do you think there's a danger that there's going to be a capability gap looming? Well, I, I mean, that's a, that's always a challenge and it, there's always there's always a risk. I mean, we, it remains to be seen because the, the publicly uh, stated information is, to my mind, at least somewhat ambiguous. Uh, what I heard the Secretary of State say was there's a commitment to order three um, with the possibility of up to six. Um, clearly, there's a capability requirement for six to replace the ships that are going out, although the capabilities of uh, aviation and surface offload, logistics and medical and so on are packaged differently in these ships. But I think there's, there's a clear requirement for six, whether the other three will follow this initial order, uh, I think we'll, we'll need to wait and see. And the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sabenki, said in a briefing at the same conference that he would anticipate the crew of the new support ships to be much smaller than that of HMS Albion or Bulwark. He said technology allows you to reduce the numbers. Why would you put into harm's way more people than you need to? Does that address con uh, the concerns about having enough crew? Well, well, in part, but I think there's the first thing that that's got to be decided is whether these are going to be Royal Navy crewed ships or Royal Fleet Auxiliary crewed ships, because the two LPDs, Albion and Bulwark, that they will replace are uh, His Majesty's Royal Navy ships, HMS is crewed by Royal Navy sailors. Uh, the landing uh, ship auxiliaries, the Bay class RFAs, Royal Fleet Auxiliaries and RFA Argus, um, are, are all Royal Fleet Auxiliary crewed ships. So how these ships will be crewed, whether by Royal Navy uniformed personnel or by the merchant sailors of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, I, I think will have a quite a profound impact on, on how we crew them. But, but to your point about the first sea order numbers, um, we are going to have to find some more sailors and we are going to have to grow the Navy in order to in order to crew these ships going forward in my mind there's no doubt about that technology will help um but but there aren't great workforce dividends to come from uh the ships that are already being built so the type 26 frigates the dreadnought class submarines the type 31 frigates and indeed the mine countermeasures capabilities that the mine hunting capability program is delivering are, are all designed they're all on contract they're being built we know what they are and, and so the, the opportunities for technology to, to create great workforce dividends there to reinvest in, in MRSS is pretty limited. MRSS is yet to be designed, as the first seed lord said, and so there may be some opportunities there. The challenge you've got with those is that a lot of the work that amphibious ships do, the moving of stores, the operating of uh, aviation, looking after patients, um, and so on is actually quite workforce intensive. You need a lot of people to to move these things around. So automation can help, of course, but, but actually a lot of it is is going to require um, people for some time to come. In my view, you can't replace that experience. It takes time to grow people up through the system with the right skills. Steve, what's your answer to Grant Shapps's question about the lessons for the Navy from Ukraine, where the Black Sea has been attacked again and again by Ukrainian unmanned surface vehicles? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, there's a there's a genuine threat there, but I don't think actually it's very new. The use of uh, fire ships, uh, drone ships to go and attack a fleet in harbour or in very con confined waters goes all the way back to antiquity, and indeed. Sir Francis Drake did that and singed the King of Spain's beard famously in Cadiz. The technology is new, but the principle is the same. And of course, the lesson from the Black Sea is that fleets in harbour and in very confined waters are vulnerable. Well, we knew that. Uh, you only have to look around the Portsmouth area to see the fortifications that it will put up in previous eras to protect the ships in harbour. And so we need to learn those lessons. But it would be a fundamental mistake to assume that because in those specific circumstances, um, there's been some success against that particular fleet that, that somehow ships on the open ocean uh, or, in, or in more expansive waters uh, are under the same sort of threat and the same sort of tactics would, would prevail. So, you know, the idea that because um, in, in Odessa or, or, or wherever there have been these um, attacks using small boats, 
but somehow that that means that our aircraft carriers um, in the North Atlantic or in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean or wherever would be similarly vulnerable is 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 flawed logic. So we must learn the lessons from Ukraine quite rightly, but we must make sure we learn the right lessons and not false lessons. And when you take a step back and look at the overall picture, do you think the Navy has the best, the right balance between the ships that are being built? Well, I'm really excited about the shipbuilding program. Um, I think there's some some really good ships coming through. I think the Type 26 and Type 31 mix is really powerful. And they give the opportunity for spiral acquisition. The new integrated procurement model, which has recently been um, announced by the Ministry of Defence, focuses on spiral development. So it means getting things into service quickly and then upgrading them through their life. And that was literally part of the strategy for Type 31 to make them adaptable to the evolving and prevailing threat. So we should see plenty of additional capabilities being inserted in those ships through life. I think they'll be fantastic, fantastic ships for the Royal Navy. W would we like more? Would we like to do more? Would we like a bigger Navy? Of course, we're an island nation um, and we should do what we can, but we, we are where we are. And we've got to, to make the best of what we've got. And we've got a really exciting shipbuilding program. Commodore Steve Prest. And you can read more from Steve on the Forces News website, forces.net. Uh, so, Peter Roberts, uh, of course, budgets are key in all of this. Uh, MPs recently said there is a gulf between the MOD's equipment plan for the next 10 years and the available budget of almost £17 billion. But Grant Shapps, in his speech, pointed to the pledge to spend 2.5% of GDP on defence by 2030. What, what is your assessment of where the Navy is in terms of the funding for this shipbuilding programme? As ever, with military budgets, this is all about the phasing of money. In many ways, this is maybe promising to maybe buy something in the future with a future paycheck, depending on people agreeing to a pay rise that you're going to get at some stage in due course. Effectively, this announcement to replace six ships, definitely with three, perhaps with three others, uh, is in a really early stage of acquisition. So there aren't any costs, there aren't even any plans at the moment for this. And funding, most importantly, is going to be dependent on the next government abiding by these plans. They could, of course, decide the programme doesn't go ahead. Frankly, mm. even 2.5% isn't going to put the British Armed Forces in a position to be able to fight effectively in 10 years' time. Indeed, one might, one might wonder whether we even have a decade to prepare the rhetoric of a pre-war condition that we should be and often referred to by military chiefs and politicians alike doesn't seem to be matched by the reality of their action. Currently, this feels like all talk and no trousers. Interesting. And uh, what would you say then um, are the lessons for the Navy from the Black Sea and the Gulf? Well, the lessons from the Ukraine and the Gulf uh, uh, for navies are really varied. The two conflicts have markedly different lessons. In Ukraine, the main lesson for naval forces seems to be that large ships make excellent targets, that surface combatants have difficulty in defending against attacks by swarms of small munitions and surface attacks. And this is not the case in the Red Sea, where lessons seem to be that modern missiles can defeat drones and missile attacks against naval platforms. Now, neither of these, as Steve just said, is particularly new. Western analysts from across NATO have been saying this for almost a decade. Perhaps the way these lessons are being interpreted by various navies in the West is more interesting and revealing. So the French Navy recently doubled the crew size of its deployed warships in the Red Sea, realising that lean crewed ships just couldn't retain the vigilance needed in a high threat environment. And this clearly goes against those trends and that talk of decreasing crew size as much as possible, which mm -hmm. is in itself driven by cost grounds. Interesting take, hasn't it? Um, stay with us. Uh, so to Ukraine now, where a Russian offensive is underway in the northeast of the country. The Daily Telegraph's Colin Freeman was on the ground near Kharkiv earlier this week and told me what he saw there. We went into a town called Vovchansk, which is one of the main places that the Russians have been attacking. It's a town of, I think, of about fifteen to 20,000 people normally. There's currently, or prior to this latest attack, by the Russians, probably only about 3,000 people living there. Um, and it's coming under quite heavy shelling. There is uh, a group of uh, volunteers, civilian volunteers and um, policemen who are going in and out of the town to rescue people who are still there, some of whom are trapped by shelling or just plain scared to leave. 
So we joined one of their convoys going into the town. We drove in from a, um, a, a kind of a rendezvous point about 10 kilometers south of Vovchansk. It was, uh, it was quite lively. There was um, uh, quite a lot of shelling in the town when we were there. I think we were, we were only there for about 15 minutes. This is a, a very quick rescue operation. The, the volunteers hammer on the doors of the, the, the people who need rescuing. And they say, right, come on, g grab, your, grab your stuff and get in the car and let's get, let's get going straight away. There's no pleasantries. The whole thing was over in about 10 or 15 minutes. And in that time, I think I counted about five or six incoming shells and then um, some of which landed relatively close to us to be able, hard to say exactly where they were going and on the on the horizon across the town there were various spots where there was poles of smoke burning um, clearly places where you know this thick black smoke clearly places that had only just been hit so it's very lively up there Colin it's really good to speak to you thank you so much for spending the time with us and stay safe thank you you're welcome thanks well, Simon Newton has been focusing on the Ukraine conflict for SITREP. Uh, Simon, hi. What does okay. this tell us about Russia's strategy? Well, I think, I mean, Colin was saying what we're seeing really is a drive by the Russians to, to stretch the Ukrainians at key points along along this long 1,200 kilometre front line. Now, they've expanded their army, we believe, to around just over half a million troops now. So although they're not making huge gains, this this force of numbers, this weight really is forcing the the Ukrainians to spread out what artillery and ammunition they do have to deal with each of these attacks in turn. So, so things aren't really looking good for Kyiv at the moment. They they need this delayed US military aid fast. They need these SAMs, surface air missiles. They need a way of countering uh, the Russian missile threat, the glide bombs, etc. And they need to build their army up in size very quickly before it just becomes totally exhausted by the weight of this Russian mass coming towards them. And Simon, you've just come back from a NATO exercise designed mm. to test the alliance's ability to quickly reinforce the alliance's eastern flank and deter Russia. Yeah, this was exercise immediate response, which is part of um, exercise steadfast defender, which you may have heard about this big Europe wide maneuver that's going on. Uh, this was 12 Brigade, part of 3 Div, which is the Army's warfighting division. It's in Poland with two battle groups, one from the Royal Welsh and another from one Mercian, about two and a half thousand troops, 800 vehicles and uh, two squadrons of Challenger 2s there as well. So they're focusing on a couple of things, really. One is how quickly they could actually physically get troops and kit to Poland if they needed to. And secondly, how they'd operate, how the armoured infantry would work with the tanks, how they'd cross um, the hundreds of rivers in this part of northern Europe. Uh, and this river crossing skill is really something that's coming back into focus. You know, I, it was really fascinating to see the Polish military with all this ex-Soviet uh, uh, kits, these armoured vehicles being given a lift across the river by British amphibious engineers. So, I mean, Ukraine is only 450 or so miles from where this exercise was taking place in Drafsko Um I asked Major Ryan Smith from 12 Brigade headquarters how events there are influencing the, the way they train. So Ukraine's impacted us in the same way that all conflicts impact us. We take lessons from those and we look at how that would affect any modern battle space and we implement procedures, techniques and tactics to, to work within that. In terms of FPV drones, that's a capability that's been around quite a long time now. It's relatively new to the British Army, but importantly, our counter to that, that threat has been ongoing and the work's been ongoing for quite some time now. And I know that the US Army are also quite developed in that area. So, so that drone threat he's talking about is something they're really actively training for on this exercise. Um, I went to part of the woods where the Royal Welsh had been given the challenge of building some trenches, trench uh, systems, defensive trenches that would be pretty much impossible to see from the air. Uh, you know, we've all seen on Telegram, etc., these Ukrainian and Russian trenches with these open entrances. The, these were very different. And I went down into one of them through a very small hatch in the ground, only really big enough for just sort of one man and his weapon system to get in. That That dropped down into a into a, a sort of tunnel and that went to two gun emplacements. And, and these were really totally concealed. It was hard even to, to see them when I was filming outside until they actually opened up with their machine guns. Um, this was Captain Max Burns, who's an instructor at Brecon and who was teaching the course. The, the conflict that we've seen in the moment is showing the absolute importance of overhead protection, not least just from artillery and mortar rounds coming in, but also cover from view from air, whether that's more conventional air like planes and helicopters, or if that's drones, which are now ubiquitous. Uh, and the vital thing is to stay concealed and then give yourself that last bit of protection. And that's the task we've given the lads here. The entire trench is either covered by conventional overhead protection, i.e. 45 centimetres of earth, or using concealment, bracken, nets, anything they can to protect that view from above, and also those drones coming 
coming in, just not being able to get them access to those trenches. Um, one other interesting thing that he was teaching was ha actually how the Russians attack trenches, the tactics they use, the, the diamond formations they use, and how also they, they rotate more competent soldiers, these VDV paratroopers, for instance, in and out of the front line, then replace them with conscripts. So, so I came away from there really knowing there's no, there's no doubt what threat NATO you know, is actually now training for. Really good to hear from you, Simon. Thanks for that. Uh, Peter Roberts, um, America's um, top diplomat, Anthony Blinken, has said Ukraine can decide for itself now whether to strike targets inside Russia with US-supplied weapons. But he says the US wouldn't encourage it. Uh, are we in a critical point now in Western's strategy? Do you think is it changing? Um, I think that's a really good question because, frankly, we don't know what the U.S. strategy is. We don't know what the U.S. is trying to achieve in Ukraine. Sure, they're giving Ukraine weapons, but is this simply an effort to weaken the Russian militarily over the long term? Or are they serious about wanting to see the Ukrainian people actually reclaim all the land that has been annexed by Russia? That's just not clear. The only thing we know about Russian strategy on Ukraine is the fear of Russian escalation up to and including the use of nuclear weapons. And that factor overrides all other thoughts in Washington, D.C. It's that uncertainty that's put the war in uh, Ukraine into the current position, one that seems to be favoring Russian forces at the moment. Sending arms to Ukraine is important, but doing it in a timely manner is vital. Even if they're on planes ready to fly out of the US as soon as the US president has agreed to them, they take weeks, sometimes months, before they're retooled to be used by troops in contact. That's not just re-engineering systems and equipment, but it applies to much of the ammunition as well. Uh, and Peter, a potential key moment for Russia now under new military leadership. Yeah, I mean, you know, with the Kremlin spending nearly 6% of their GDP on defence, the reconstitution of military war stocks and production lines for military equipment is progressing rapidly. So much so that there are a lot of analysts now saying the Russian military will be reconstituted entirely within three years. And increasing trade outside of the West has minimised the impact of the sanctions that have been imposed by the West on Russian industries. And the man responsible for that, Andrei Bulovsov, has just taken up position as Defence Minister of Russia. His, one of his core missions is going to be to root out the corruption that's sort of endemic in the Russian Ministry of Defence. The appointment of this guy, who's an economist by background, is seen as a move designed to increase efficiency and weed out some of that bribery and failed delivery and the lack of quality coming from Russian arms producers. And there's likely to be a greater focus on innovation, pushing through new equipment to the front line, all very worrying for Ukraine and, in the longer term, for NATO. News, discussions and analysis. This is Sitrep. Now, how do soldiers balance the military need to take ground during conflict with the duty to protect the historic sites and priceless artefacts that may be in the way? That question was raised around the world 80 years ago this weekend when the Battle of Monte Cassino came to an end in Italy after months of fighting, which left 75,000 Allied and German dead and the famous Benedictine monastery at the top of the mountain in ruins. After a month of trying to take it, the Allies bombed the monastery on the 15th of February with a thousand tons of explosives, killing 230 civilians sheltered there. It was finally taken on the 18th of May. Well, to discuss the battle and the line between military necessity and protection of sites, we're joined by Dr. Peter Caddick Adams, the author of Monte Cassino, Ten Armies in Hell. He was an army reservist and regular for many years and has experienced in various war zones, including Bosnia, Afghanistan and Iraq. And we're also joined by Roger Curtis, the commander of the Cultural Property Protection Unit, which was set up in 2018. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Peter, the bombing of Monte Cassino was one of the most controversial decisions in the Allied campaign, and it led to calls for historic sites to be protected. What was lost in that assault? The Abbey was, uh, if you like, a, a sort of UNESCO heritage site. This is before UNESCO was invented. It was about 1,500 years old, uh, and every generation of monks and abbots there had collected fine artwork. So it was a, an accumulation of everything the Western world had in terms of um, sculpture, manuscripts, paintings, uh, tapestries, uh, you name it. A cross-section of Western cultural life was contained uh, within the Abbey. A lot had been evacuated up to the Vatican in Rome, um, but there simply wasn't, there was far too much to sort of move 
Um, and uh, this was a disaster, if you like, sort of waiting to happen. And Peter, it followed a command from General Eisenhower in late 1943 about protecting historic sites. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this, this, this stemmed from sort of churches, particularly um, that were attacked in Sicily. Um, but the danger was as much from our own side um, commandeering uh, places and destroying them while inhabiting them or, or whatever, uh, unwittingly tearing things apart, uh, as much as um, uh, churches and so on being the targets of, uh, of, of, of military operation. Um, and, and it's not just the buildings, it's the content. So it's libraries and it's paintings and it's mm. sculptures uh, and things like that. Um, and uh, it, it, it didn't, not only was there a sense of duty to future generations, but of course in the, the, the day-to-day combat that was being reported very openly without, cens- without much censorship, this didn't play well across the, uh, the Western world and to, to, to neutral uh, countries as well, because um, we needed to understand that we were um, playing, uh, we, were, we were observing the rules of war as best we could. Roger Curtis, can you tell us a bit more about the aim of your unit now, 80 years after these events? Yes, so um, thank you for the introduction. So the Cultural Property Protection Unit was set up uh, 2018, as you said. Uh, We now sit within the um, uh, 11 Brigade Security Force Assistance, part of UK OneDiv. And our objective is to honour the UK's obligations, having signed or ratified the Hague Convention 2017, and indeed other international legal frameworks that protect cultural property, which have been in place for quite a long time, and Peter referred to some of that. Um, We operate to advise commanders in in UK Ministry of Defence across the three services on on making or helping make these balanced decisions between military necessity and the requirements of the Hague Convention to respect and protect uh, cultural property of all types from all periods uh, belonging to all peoples. Um, And as was mentioned, part of that is educating your own forces, but also advising commanders on how one might uh, judge what constitutes military necessity uh, versus what is sometimes said military convenience. Um, So that's that's where we're starting from. And uh, many engagement points uh, are coming to light across the world, as has been described. And Roger, getting that balance right, I mean, as General Eisenhower said, in the end, men's lives count for infinitely more. So how do you advise military commanders about protecting historic sites in conflict? How do you get that balance right? Well, the first thing is, in in conflict, um, we will not be able to protect everything. And one has to make a balance on the military requirements and obligations that the command to fulfill the commander's mission. Um, We would also like to argue that good uh, cultural property protection is is good for everyone. It's good for the civilian population. It's good for the the area or the state where you're working in. And also there is evidence that suggests respect uh, for cultural property of the area will actually reduce casualties, particularly in an insurgency operation. So we have to make a a very fine and and often difficult balance. Mm. But I think making sure military commanders understand their legal obligations under the Hague Convention and other international law frameworks and getting a good tactical outcome that expedites the, the their mission and ultimately reduces um, uh, casualties, both civilian and military. And Peter, what kind of impact does it have when cultural artefacts are deliberately targeted by an aggressor? For example, the Ministry of Defence says Russia's bombardment of cities in Ukraine is having a devastating effect on its cultural, historical and religious heritage. Um, we could go to the, the war in Syria and the impact that uh, Islamic State had on destroying lots of monuments um, because uh, they were not in keeping with their own beliefs. Uh, and the ripple of that and, and the killing of the archaeologists associated with their ongoing uncovering, you know, caused horror um, all through the world. <laughs> Um, and of course, the the other aspect from that is is the trade in archaeological sort of bits and pieces which, which have been trickling out of these war zones, which need to be controlled as well. So the impact is absolutely huge. And in in our age, we're far more aware of um, archaeology, of historic treasures than ever before, uh, and access to them. Um, and of course, the way we look at you know what what's in the contents of museums as well is you know a very lively debate at the moment. So this is you know 
far more important than it ever used to be. And what we're talking about, of course, is the Monuments Men. This this is the, the organisation that Eisenhower created and uh, it eventually evolved into a book in a very famous film um, not so long ago. But this is this is here to stay. This, uh, this re- cultural requirement is never going to go away. And the more we are faced with war zones, the more responsibility we have to preserve all these artifact, artifacts and sites for future generations. And Roger, how closely do you work with other countries in this work? We're very well joined up with with other militaries and their cultural property protection arrangements, be they mandated officers or be they uh, officers who are uh, sort of dual hatted with existing roles in the uh, civil military cooperation domain. I think it's worth mentioning um, that that we are uh, part of the human security uh, thematic focus where the security of the population is given equal prominence to that of the state uh, and how that weaves in with the the wider uh, spectrum of conflict of which the information operations is going to be is is a significant part influence countering malign influence uh, and, and in an age of of mass media that that reaches pretty much everywhere the the information play the leverage that that can can deliver uh, as part of the the emotional reach and attachment that culture of of all types plays means that this is going to be a, a key part as as peter referred to going forward we, we've we've worked and trained with with many other states um, and their armed forces some of whom have been doing this for much longer than we have uh, and as was mentioned uh, the uk did have a monuments and fine arts commission which worked with us officers during the the second world war uh, and advised commanders even back then but that capability was uh, was lost after the second war mm. uh, and only more recently has come back but uh, working with allies and partners in in this domain um, is a is a big part of our work much more to talk about but i guess that'll be for another time uh, commander roger curtis dr peter caddick adams thank you so much for your time uh, and peter thank you for joining us this week and uh, just before we do let you go and let you off um I guess uh, this kind of consideration, the preservation of cultural artifacts, maybe didn't come up so much as, as a Navy man. Yeah, you're right. The sea has uh, many less human-made cultural or architectural structures than you consideration. I was always struck when I was ashore, though, that someone in the fight where people are trying to kill you, to make these decisions and, and have these perspectives is, is fraught with difficulties. At RUSI, we thought this was so important that we recruited a military archaeologist, Sarah Ashbridge, to the military sciences team to help us think about some of these things. She made a huge impact on the team, but perhaps it'll be time for that discussion another day. Peter, thank you so much, and thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. I'll be back with another SITREP next Thursday. Until then, you can always catch up with past programmes online at bfbs.com slash SITREP, the Forces News YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. 